Well, good afternoon. Thanks for having me here. Um, I really want to talk about what's what's most important to you all. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to give you a few introductory remarks, and then I'd really like to open it up for a dialogue to talk about these issues. Um, the I've worked for coming up on 40 years on affordable housing issues in low-income neighborhoods. I got my start in um, when I was an undergraduate student at the University of Texas at Austin. And one day, is, uh, I was in the history program, and one of my professors says, uh, okay, your assignment is to go out and do an oral history interview in the community. Pick a place to go. So I asked around where was an interesting place to go, and I was told that, well, there's this, there's this small settlement of, of African-American families that have been in this Austin neighborhood since uh, the end of the Civil War. So I thought that would be an interesting place to go. And I went out and knocked on the door of the neighborhood center there and introduced myself to the woman who ran the neighborhood center who was like a fourth generation resident of the neighborhood. And I said, hi, I'm John Henneberger. I'm a history student at the University of Texas at Austin. And uh, I need to do an oral history interview. And she says, well, let me tell you what I need and what this community needs. And um, that, I still haven't managed to, to address that demand after, uh, that was made of me originally back, I guess, about 1973, 74. Um, that community at the time was undergoing uh, pressure from the state of Texas, which was routing a, uh, a major state highway through part of the neighborhood. And the city council was considering a proposal to, to route a crosstown expressway through the other part of the neighborhood. And yet this neighborhood, while it was in the wealthiest part of Austin, surrounded by the home of Governor Pease, Governor Shivers, uh, the, the judges at the courthouse and the like, it was a small, impoverished African-American neighborhood of 15 square blocks, which had no paved streets, no drainage, uh, and, and really desperately poor housing conditions. But it was a community of such value, such pride, such integrity, that people valued that community so strongly and people had been there for multiple generations. It's really interesting for me to think back about that because I, I, I think I didn't, I wouldn't have known what gentrification meant and I wouldn't have, at the time back then, but I think I w we were really experiencing what in Austin has become a, uh, a, a deeply troubling and challenging problem. In fact, I was telling the folks earlier uh, at lunch that I think this issue about are we willing to value racial and economic diversity in our city? Are we willing to honor low-income people who create community over multiple generations in an area? Are we willing to preserve that type of thing? I have watched Austin go from a city which was a deeply southern city and had deep problems with racial prejudice and still does, but a city which did not value diversity at all, to a city today where the number one political issue, if you ask anybody, ask our mayor, ask our city council members, the number one issue in our city is how do we maintain affordability and diversity? And are we going to allow people of different ethnic backgrounds, of different races, and of different income levels, are, are we a city that's going to accommodate that population in a way that's integrated? Or are we going to essentially allow people to be pushed out and priced out by the, the operations of a, of, a, uh, of a real estate market which does not have those values? Uh, we haven't figured that answer out yet, and I'm not here to tell you that we've got any, uh, that we got this stuff worked out. But I think this is an issue that, I think from what I understand, you all may be thinking about. I know that at the core of the solution is to be able to maintain affordable housing options. The, um, it, it's kind of hard to get your head around the complexity of all of these, uh, of this diversity 
issue, this inclusion issue, this equity issue that we read about and hear about so much in the newspaper. Um, you go out in the neighborhood and you ask people, um, you know, what's the community problem? You go into a low-income neighborhood, people say, and we just heard uh, one of the one of your uh, the fellow students here say that, uh, well, you know, in, in the neighborhood I work in, it's sidewalks. We don't have sidewalks. In another neighborhood, it's, it's affordable housing. Um, those are all clearly problems, but they're discrete problems, and they're part of a bigger whole about this question of inequality that we talk about almost obsessively these days, but don't seem to be able to have much of a handle on how to address. I work with, um, I approach these problems uh, based on what I was taught when I went out in the 70s and knocked on that neighborhood center door and asked people, asked to do some interviews. I approach it from the notion of uh, people have to find these solutions for themselves and that people have an inherently deep human need to be able to solve problems. And this problem of lack of affordable housing or inadequate infrastructure or are we going to be an inclusive and racially and economically diverse society is really one that you know, will only be solved when people begin to, uh, to look at these problems together and to address them. I've had, a, uh, I've had the opportunity, the Ford Foundation has provided us some, uh, some funding over the years, and we have passed a lot of that funding through to community-based organizations who do organizing work, community organizing work, to bring neighbors together, to get organized, to speak out on issues of these type of problems. And I know one of the things that you all are thinking about here in Little Rock is, uh, and in Arkansas as a whole, is this question about can you build a coalition around affordable housing? Is it possible to bring people together around this issue? And I want to talk for you, to you for a few minutes about how we've had some successes in building coalitions uh, around these type of issues. And I want to also talk, talk to you about this from two perspectives. One, from the perspective of, of folks like me, professionals, outsiders, people who are trying to, you know, people who are basically paid to fix things. And I also want to talk to you a little bit about it from the perspective of uh, low-income people within neighborhoods and how, what their role is and how they're, they're involved and uh, what they have to contribute. Um, we started out uh, realizing that we had to be able to have more resources for affordable housing if we were going to be able to preserve inclusive communities. That uh, the housing conditions were central to the problem. Um, one, of the, um, one of the principal problems that we've had for a long time is that we've been totally dependent upon federal block grant funds. And local elected officials are not very respectful of the way that they treat federal block grant funds. It's like money that comes down from Washington and it's got to be given out and it's a purely political consideration and it's pretty much locked in and the amount of federal funds decreases every year and so you're never really getting in front of the um, of the problem. So we decided that we needed to try to bring people together to try to create a pool of funds to be able to uh, provide uh, a supplement to these federal funds for affordable housing. The, there is a robust community in Austin of neighborhood associations. We went first to them and we said, Afford how can affordable housing work for you? And it turns out that they, they were one of our biggest allies in being able to, uh, to approach this problem. They were concerned about being pushed out, about losing their old housing stock, about being zoned commercial and have that housing stock uh, decay and, uh, and be removed from the community. So they were a, they were a resource. Uh, gradually, this became a major issue in the community. The, 
The real estate community also became concerned about this. But our real supporters were always a coalition of low-income people and, and uh, existing mainstream white neighborhood associations of people who were desperately afraid of losing uh, the affordable housing stock and the, uh, the housing and, and having seen their neighborhoods change enormously. We, um, we put up a general obligation bond issue as a first start. And this was 35, 40 years ago. And we got beat bad. Uh, we did a classic uh, bond campaign where we went and we said, um, we, we asked for $45 million of general obligation bonds from the voters, and we didn't make a very good case for it. We basically said, uh, do it because it's the right thing to do. We didn't build a coalition around it, and we got defeated. We went back and we spent uh, about 10 years reorganizing around this issue, bringing in the realtors, bringing in the environmentalists, bringing in the neighborhood associations. We came back and about 12 years ago, we passed our first bond issue, which was, on, uh, I think, about a $35 million general obligation bond issue. And we put it in something we called a housing trust fund, although it wasn't really a trust fund. It was basically just a, a grant program that, that we used. We were fortunate because we had community organizations, both neighborhoods that were really interested in locating scattered site, low density, affordable housing within their neighborhoods as infill in order to be able to prevent the commercial revitalization of their neighbor, the commercial uh, change in their neighborhoods, the loss of, of, of affordable housing. And uh, we also had um, the real estate community, which was concerned about doing something positive about the situation. And we had the low-income neighborhoods uh, who, as I said, you know, have a vital interest in this, uh, in this type of issue. Uh, we have been very fortunate because we've had uh, nonprofit organizations which develop multifamily affordable housing that are first class in terms of the type of housing they provide. They are widely seen across the community as really producing very high quality housing. And they tie learning centers into the housing. So uh, these properties are seen as a real success. And they're properties that are actually welcomed by middle income neighborhoods, even though they're largely affordable housing developments. They're just very well run. And so most of the money in that first bond issue went into those type of developments. Scattered site single family housing and multifamily housing operated by highly competent uh, nonprofit uh, organizations. Also, some money went to people with disabilities. And so we spent that money down pretty quickly, and we came back for a $60 million bond issue. And uh, uh, about three years after that first bond issue. And that was going to be a much heavier lift. The uh, political environment had changed. It was much more conservative. It was much more hostile to property taxes. These are general obligation bonds. These are stuff that people are paying out of their local property taxes. Um, it, it was a very heavy lift at that point in time. So we set up a committee and we did what groups do all the time is we went out and hired us some political experts who, you know, were going to do polling and advise us on what works. And the political experts came in and we thought, okay, well, we'll just turn this over to these guys because these guys are the experts and they really know how to do this type of stuff. And the, our polling numbers started here and they went like this. The, the, the political experts did not understand the community. For one thing, they kept telling us, well, you can't really talk about poor people and you, for God's sakes, don't want to put people of color on the on the literature and the advertisements because that's just going to get a white backlash on things and it's, it's not going to work. So we started talking about home ownership for people between 80 and 100, 120% of median family income. We talked about firefighters. We talked about teachers. This is all the type of stuff that people commonly tell you. You've got to appeal to, to people about you're serving that type of demographic. And our numbers were tanking on uh, public support on this stuff. So we commissioned another poll. And we asked people, you know, well, who is it that you would be willing to pay 
uh, you know, $8 a year in additional property taxes uh, in order to provide affordable housing for. And lo and behold, folks said, well, we're concerned about the homeless. We're concerned about really low-income families. We're concerned about children growing up in poverty. We're concerned about, uh, you know, all of the stuff that the, uh, our political campaign experts told us was a no-go. So we did a 180-degree uh, on our approach to this, and we, we just went with what we had been doing with the money before. We said, look at this nonprofit that's built these apartments that have learning centers. Look at the changes in kids' lives you know, who've, who live in that apartment versus people who live in the public house, the, the most segregated, the most economically depressed public housing in the city and the like. And lo and behold, the voters overwhelmingly voted $60 million of bonds. And then we voted another $60 million of bonds a few years later. So, you know, my community is, has a reputation of being kind of, well, we call ourselves weird. That's the, uh, that's the you know, keep Austin weird is the motto in Austin. But um, we're not that weird. We flatter ourselves to think that we're weird. We're, we're pretty mainstream, and our values are pretty much mainstream, and our voter population, I mean, we tend a little more democratic, and we tend something more liberal, I'll admit that. But, um, you know, the lesson I took away from this is people of good conscience, voters, people who are going to actually have to pay the cost of doing these type of things, don't BS them. Just tell them, you, find a solution to a problem. Figure out what works and go with that. And shine the light on it. Our newspapers cover these type of programs and the success of, uh, of the outcome for children in these type of areas. Um, we have had very little active opposition to being able to support housing trust fund and, and, and bond issues. Let me turn quickly and talk for a minute about the, at the state level how we've approached these type of problems. Um, the state is a different animal. I mean, I say Austin's not that liberal, but compared to the Texas legislature, Austin is, uh, you know, <laughs> Chairman Mao's true believers, I guess. But um, it, it's a very conservative place, and it's, um, folks are, um, Folks are not immediately warm and friendly toward um, poor people and toward government programs. But think about what people support. And I mean, you know, when I go in, and I, I'm a lobbyist in the legislature, and I still go down there and, and, and I talk about these programs, but, you know, even the most conservative members of the legislature who say, will tell you, we don't believe in these government programs and that type of thing, they and their husband and wife are out volunteering for Habitat for Humanity, and they're writing checks. They believe in what works. And so you've got ultimately, in order to be able to appeal to people, you've got to have a solution to appeal to people. You can't walk in and appeal to people purely on an ideological basis. Do this because it's the poor. Do this because it's people of color and it's the right thing to do and people have been mistreated. It doesn't sell. But what does sell is that uh, is is the is the habitat for humanity situation. Habitat is the highest ranked brand of all social service agencies in the country. When when they do polling and they do focus groups, you know, people you ask people what's your favorite candy, they say Hershey's Kisses. What's your favorite airlines? People say Delta. Oh, no, it's Southwest. I figured that one out. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, I mean, but and, and which, what is your favorite nonprofit organization? And people overwhelmingly, for year after year, say Habitat for Humanity because it is a solution that people can understand and can identify with. So uh, you've got to do what works. You've got to have something that you are advocating that is perceived as a solution. And this goes back to the notion of we are all problem solvers, essentially. We all want to believe that there is ultimately an answer to these problems. And if we are approached with information which actually lays out something that is compelling and does prove that there is an answer to something, then we'll sign up for it. So about 20 years ago, I went to, I went to the Texas legislature and um, we wanted to pass a housing trust fund. 
So we did the classic thing that the Center for Community Change at the time, Mary Brooks, who was the director then, she says to us, okay, the best revenue source is an income transfer tax. So what you gotta do is you gotta get the legislature to enact an income transfer, uh, not an income transfer, a real estate transfer tax. You know, you gotta go down there and you gotta get, um, you gotta get the legislature to vote, number one, to disclose what the sales price of all property is, and number two, to give you 10 bucks or 100 bucks on every so many dollars of, of, of transfer. And you get millions of dollars that way and it all works out great. So we did that. And we went nowhere. We went absolutely nowhere. I mean, there was no political support when we approached this thing as, let's do a tax for affordable housing. So two years later, we came back and we, had a, we identified a program in the Rio Grande Valley in South Texas where extremely low-income immigrants, most, uh, all Hispanic, um, were living in substandard, grossly substandard housing conditions in communities called colonias, which are outside of urban areas, and many of them lacked water and sewer. I mean, these are communities like rural Arkansas. You've probably seen some of these. There's probably still a few of them out there, you know, to this day. We got them in rural Texas, and we got a lot of them, had a lot of them down along the border. And um, the, a little group down there of farm workers had come together and said, and actually I learned this, I have to tell you, I learned this from a group that was doing this work here in Arkansas in the Delta, which was, I can't remember what they were called, but it was self-help housing something. And what the, the farm worker said to us is, we don't want public housing, we don't want uh, you know, somebody to build us a house and give it to us. What we'd really like is, you know, we've we bought a lot already. We just like somebody to finance the building materials and maybe lend us some tools so we could build the houses. So we went to a uh, private foundation and we said, we got these people willing to do this. Uh, will you lend us some money? So they lent us $12,500 at 0% interest. And we went down and we found six families and we said, we only got enough money to buy the materials for one house. So they drew straws. And then all six families came together and built that first house. And we took pictures of it. And we took members of the Texas legislature down there to watch this process. And they went, holy cow, this is like so Texan. You know, I mean, we, the way we in Texas think, you know, it's like, well, we're the special people. You know, we, we know how to, you know, the way we do things is the right way. And, but, you know, this is so Texan. So um, one of the guys says, these people are pulling themselves up by their own bootstraps. So we called it the Bootstrap Program, the Texas Bootstrap Loan Program. Zero percent interest, 20-year term, got to work with a nonprofit, kind of modeled after Habitat for Humanity. And so we built the first house, and the legislators saw it, and we, they threw money at this thing. They threw $10 million the first year into a housing trust fund for that program. They wouldn't give us a dime to be able to do affordable housing when we came to them and talked to them about a transfer tax. And we, we're talking about the money. But when we talk about the people, when we talk about the housing, and when we talk about you know, people helping themselves, then all of a sudden it works in Texas, which is the, the really important lesson I think we have to learn is we, we gotta talk about solutions to people. The only way we move people is when we offer something that people go, like Habitat, where people go, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'll, I'll give $100 for that. When you got that, then the government is, then my experience is that the government's willing to listen. That was 15, 20 years ago. We get $10 million every year in Texas. Now, it's not a lot of money. And I'm embarrassed about this because I go to these national conferences with my colleagues in other states and they go, well, we have a $60 million housing trust fund. Well, we don't. We got a $10 million housing trust fund. But we built 1,500, not us, we built, but people have built 1,500 houses at 0% interest. The default rate is nothing because if you sweat and build the house yourself, you're gonna do it. So that's a program that's not gonna work in New York. I don't think that you know, the, the low-income community is ready to immediately embrace that. But that's a program that's gonna work in Texas because basically people just say, why would I pay anybody else to build a house for me when you know, I can do it myself? And it resonates with our local people. So you know, like the multifamily housing development in Austin, 
that is the basis on which we get 120, 160 million dollars of taxpayer supported bonds to do just because people look at it and go, yeah, the kids are doing better. They've got a better life. There's no crime coming out of that development. It's really well run. That's the right idea. Then the Texas legislature, which is a much harder sell, says basically the same thing. They say, that makes sense. That's Texas. That's what we believe in. We'll, we'll back people in that. So you look at this type of, type of program and you say, well, it's not really making a dent. Well, it is making a dent. And you've got to start somewhere. And you've got to start what works in the local political context that you operate in. You can't impose solutions from outside. You've got to use what the local organizations, the local people, the local nonprofits have actually demonstrated can really work. And you've got to build on those. Now, we've, we've expanded the use of our state housing trust fund. A couple of years ago, the homeless groups got involved and they said, well, you know, one thing that's really working is these multi-purpose homeless facilities in the big cities, Dallas, San Antonio, Houston, Austin. Um, these where we, we can centralize the services and we can do true case management in the thing and we provide the shelter and we're doing a housing first backdoor of these things where we're putting people in housing out of these shelters and not keeping them just temporarily housed in shelters. The mayors went and took the legislators around on a tour of that, and we're getting $5 million a year in state-appropriated funds for those type of, for those type of homeless activities. It, it, again, is selling a local program that works, selling a model that people have proven they can deliver on at the local level. Um, you know, a lot of us look for for answers in a lot of places. And I wasted a lot of my years, you know, traveling around to Massachusetts and New York and New Jersey and looking at how they do housing up there. And I, frankly, it was interesting, but uh, we don't do any of that type of approach to things. You know, we, we have locally invented solutions. We have local nonprofits that figure out how to do things and we work through them. So I guess my, um, you know, the folks from Housing in Arkansas asked me to come down and talk to you about what works about building uh, support for affordable housing and the like. And I just say, start with what you got uh, and build on what you got. Don't look for some holy grail of housing solution out there. Don't pick my model. Don't do bootstrap if that's not the thing that, you know, really works. We all are problem solvers. We all have a need to do this, to fix problems, including uh, every member of your legislature, including every member of your city council. Our mayor in Austin, our city council, they voted unanimously to put the bond issues on the agenda. They didn't the first several times they did this, but they saw the, the proof of this, and they saw they, were, they, were, they had a solution. So you've got the power right now, today, to be able to do what needs to be done to create a resource to solve problems. And I urge you to start small. I urge you to focus on your local initiatives and just go out and do it. So with that, I think I'll stop and, um, and entertain questions or comments. <laughs> All right, time for questions. Raise your hands and we'll get a microphone to you. Yes, ma'am, microphone coming. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Hennenberger. That was very informative. Um, question about the federal block grants. It seems you alluded earlier in your presentation how they weren't, the funds weren't used well are they being used better now in conjunction with these community-based programs? In some places, yes, and in some places, no. One of the biggest challenges that, uh, that's out there is, uh, is not a block grant program, but it's the low-income housing tax credit program that's administered at the state level. That's the biggest source of money that exists to create affordable housing. Um, we have seen in Texas that um, that was a program that kind of operated out of a closet where a handful of people who were connected political developers 
uh, went in and basically got money and did stuff. They put almost all the housing in really impoverished neighborhoods. They often did halfway rehab of properties, and the program got a really bad reputation uh, as a result of doing that. Um, a, as, as a result of the coalition that has come together now in Texas around affordable housing issues, we all go down and we testify on the rules for that program, and we've gotten a lot of improvements on that program. I would say, though, that qualitatively, it's really different. You get a different attitude from a city council, and you get a different attitude from a legislature when you talk about spending money that's their tax money and not federal money. Now, I, we need the federal money, absolutely. We need the federal money. We need more of it. And I'm very pleased there's, looks like there's going to be a budget agreement and maybe the money for community development block grant and home and that type of thing will be slightly restored. But um, if it's locally appropriated money, people follow the money. They go and see what happens on the ground with it. And that's certainly been the case with the bond issues. And that, if, if you're doing the right thing with the money, that builds support for the next wave of the money. So I, I think it's really important to, to monitor. Uh, it, as a coalition, not just to ask for money, but insist on accountability for the money that's out there. Carol, right here. Yes. Thank you for emphasizing that this should not be a liberal or conservative issue. It's one that affects all of us. Would you say something about involving urban areas, the important role of zoning commissions, and is there a trend that those are becoming more amenable to um, what you're doing? It varies. Um, uh, zoning, uh, zoning and uh, exclusionary land use practices are work against affordable housing. Uh, you know, a lot of cities respond to what they believe are their constituents' desires to maintain a uniform level of, of, of base level of property values within the neighborhood. And so they do things like minimum square footage requirements, uh, insist on 100% masonry exterior shells, uh, certain minimum lot sizes, and then zoning issues and the like. Um, there is big stuff happening right now at the federal level with regard to uh, pushing back on those exclusionary land use practices. Uh, President Obama and Secretary Castro announced a couple of months ago an initiative called Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing, which requires every jurisdiction, if they want to continue to get HUD block grants, that they have to look at their local land use practices and ask themselves, are we putting up barriers to the ability of lower income people, and particularly lower income people of color, to be able to access desirable parts of our community, or even to be able to afford to live in our community. My organization has shifted focus a lot, and I spend, I've, I've spent a lot of time uh, basically filing complaints uh, about where, uh, oh, let me give you, let me think of an example. Um, okay, here's one. Beaumont, Texas, down on the Gulf Coast hit by Hurricane Ike, hit by Hurricane Rita, 100-unit public housing development in, a, in an area that's like right next to the rail yard that serves the refinery, across from a Superfund site, next to the city's maintenance yard for its trucks, and then the school, parking, uh, school bus parking facility on the other side. A 100-unit public housing development in the middle of junk, horrible type of living conditions. So uh, we filed in 2010 a civil rights complaint against this, the governor uh, and successfully negotiated an agreement with the governor that said that all the money, the $3.2 billion of disaster recovery money that the state came, with, came forward with, that 55% of that money would go to restore homeowners who were low-income people and people of color to restore their homes proportionally to, to white folks and uh, that multifamily housing would be done in a manner that complied with the federal civil rights laws. So the Beaumont Housing Authority looks at this development and they say when we carved out 12 million, 15 million dollars for them to be able to, this property had lost its roof from the hurricane, and they said they'd put it back on with 
um, insurance proceeds. But So people were living back in it. And they said, well, we want to rebuild it, and we want to rebuild it where it is. And we said, well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because, I mean, people are exposed. There's this asphalt plant next door. There's rail lines with chemical tank cars that idle right next to the property the whole time, and you've got a Superfund site over there, and there's nothing for the kids. So we said, you know, you've got to relocate that development. Beaumont Housing Authority said no, so we went to HUD and we said, we, we did a map and we showed where all of Beaumont's public housing was located and we said there's nothing in a high opportunity neighborhood. If you're a mom and you got some kids and you want to get your kids in a better school, I mean the schools in the area are failing, they're all failing, but if you were over a little bit to the west of there, there were schools that were rated A by the state of Texas. So. You know, we basically went to HUD and we pushed those type of things. So I think we have to, I think we have to use the law uh, to do that. Now it becomes divisive, and I would say that I am public enemy number one in Beaumont right now, um, as a result of insisting that that public housing development be re rebuilt in another location. But uh, and I wouldn't want to go in and try to get a housing trust fund out of the Beaumont City Council right now. But that's for somebody else to do. That's for somebody in Beaumont to do that type of thing. But, you know, and that's, that's what a coalition is really all about. There's people who can play different roles. I mean, sometimes I can play bad cop. Sometimes I can play good cop. Uh, and sometimes other people are going to play bad cop on the thing. But, uh, you know, we all want a solution. Alan, do you have a question right here? I was going to ask you about housing authorities and how you can collaborate with them. Um, you mentioned that, but uh, you know we don't have the disaster to, that you just described. How, how can we best collaborate with the housing authorities? Um, your housing authority needs to work. Uh, that's the bottom line, and it needs to produce. Uh, it's really tough because their budgets have been decimated over the years. Um, your housing authority will pull down your political support if it's not operating properly. It will, it will kill, it will be the face of affordable housing in most people's minds. Um, you know, it is, it is vitally important that any coalition involve the housing authority and it's also vitally important that a coalition of residents, including residents of the housing itself and the neighborhoods immediately surrounding the public housing, be part of a conversation with the housing authority about what needs to be done to make sure that they aren't pulling down. So make sure they are a good place for, for the tenants and to make sure they're not killing public support for affordable housing. Uh, you know, the, the disaster recovery funds were an amazing resource for us. We, that was the largest single public works project in the history of the state of Texas. And because our coalition was immediately ready and we knew what happened in Katrina and we knew that low income people and people of color got the short end of the stick, we jumped on it. With a, with a complaint uh, to HUD. And HUD welcomed us in doing that, and HUD facilitated not a lawsuit and not an acrimonious thing, but basically uh, 90 days of very intense and heavy negotiations with the governor's chief of staff where we talked about equity and we talked about justice and uh, you know we got the, the resources available to us. It's a slower process where you don't have those type of money. But there are opportunities. There are uh, the Public Housing Authority RAD program, which is converting public housing to, uh, to a type of voucher, which a lot of housing authorities are taking advantage of right now. That can either be done right, or it can be done simply to perpetuate a failed uh, outcome, you know, like Beaumont. Yes, leader. My microphone coming to you. Another equation to the homeless that is low income, highly uh, African American, is the citizens who are returning from incarceration. Mm. Did you take that population into consideration when you were dealing with affordable housing? Yeah, that's, that's like, it, when uh, the community organizations that we work with, that is topic number one uh, for them right now on affordable housing. Um, it's a tough one. Uh, the uh, uh, secretary Donovan, when he was HUD secretary, asked housing authorities to consider uh, changing their occupancy standards to allow people who had uh, had a felony conviction to be able to be able to access public housing. 
most public housing authorities have chosen not to do it. And you can kind of understand why, because they get beat up so much for basically trying to operate housing on a shoestring and not having very good housing that they don't want to take the hit from the community is getting a reputation of being the place where everybody exiting incarceration ends up going. But, you know, that's no, there is no solution here, uh, you know, to this problem. I think everybody realizes this is a, this is a top issue that needs to be, that, that needs to be accommodated. We're doing a community planning project in um, a neighborhood in Houston, which is the eighth highest crime neighborhood in the United States. It's a, it's a neighborhood that's severely distressed and has a ton of Section 8 and public housing located in it. And I, I was sitting in a meeting last week with the residents, and it was the most eye-opening thing uh, to me that people who see, who, who, who see this problem of concentrated poverty the first thing people were speaking about and the one thing people wanted to get across over and over again is folks have got to have a chance. Folks have got to be able to re-enter somehow. We've got to do that. And, you know, here's a community which has really taken a hit big time over basically absorbing all of the subsidized housing and a big chunk of the city's poverty and as a result has, you know, severely deteriorated schools and crime, but they're still saying... Well, we still got to do our share. We got to let people. We got to let people in. Um, those are people who want to solve a problem. Now, th they shouldn't be the only ones solving that problem. That problem should not be totally on their back. It ought to be shared as a community-wide uh, policy that we allow for reentry and affordable housing. But I'll say that there's not nearly enough being done about that, and I think that's one of the top problems. Well, um, so I would say there's, uh, there's really three we talked about. One is the existing source of federal funds, including low-income housing tax credit, federal block grant funds, which I think if you look at, you can almost always make the case locally that they need some more attention about whether they're addressing priority issues or whether they're being efficient. Um, general revenue funds are the toughest to get, uh, but if you get it, you got buy-in and you you can sustain you can sustain it. Um, bond issues, um, I, I, you know, we found in Austin bond issues to be successful. Uh, Dallas has passed one. Houston has passed one. Austin's got passed more than everybody else. But that's it. I mean, there aren't a lot of other bond issues moving forward because there, frankly, aren't any housing coalitions. In, uh, and there's very little in the way of a housing coalition even in Dallas and, and Houston. Uh, you know, a city like Little Rock, which is an intellectual center of energy and, and ideas and state government and, and the like, is really the most likely place that you build uh, a successful housing coalition. In terms of other money beyond that, I mean, the Center for Community Change has a laundry list of, of how other people have done it. Um, again, I would just start, I would not start with how other people have done it. I would start with, um, again, what works? Uh, you know, what, uh, what resonates with people? Um, we, we get a lot of mileage on Habitat. Habitat shares in our bootstrap housing fund. Um, and uh, they've got, I don't know, 500 chapters around the state of Texas. It's ridiculous. I mean, they're every place. And they're into all the churches. And that's a population that as advocates, we don't ha have an immediate way to do that type of outreach in there. So I'd build through those type of organizations. I don't have any other magic solutions about money. Let me, uh, let's, uh, let's thank John. There's an excellent presentation. I also want to thank Ellen Gray, who was responsible for getting this program here and, and, and bringing the program to us. And John, thank you very much. This is a very enlightening, informative, and I hope uh, beneficial discussion for Arkansas. Thank you so much. For thank you. Here.